Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the library and to the Hong Kong University, uh, for those of you who are visitors. Um, it is our first book talk of the year, and it's obviously a sellout, and uh, Peter is always a, a great draw card, as is John. Um, I'm sure you're going to enjoy the evening, and I'm sure it's a sign of things to come in our future book talks for 2015. Um, Peter, I think most of you will know, is in the history department in the School of Humanities in the Faculty of Arts. Uh, he's also the director of the Hong Kong U Centenary Project and the first volume of the history uh, that Peter has authored was published in 2012. And I, I would suggest that nobody here ask him when the second volume will be due. Um, he probably won't offer an answer anyway. Um, our moderator for the evening is John Carroll, another regular here in our book talks. Uh, John is a professor in the S Department of History in the School of Humanities in the Faculty of Arts. It's a complex organisation. He's also the Associate Dean in the Faculty of Arts for Outreach. Uh, John is a uh, well-renowned historian, uh, particularly on Hong Kong history and has published widely in this area, including uh, the book, uh, Concise History of Hong Kong. So I think we've uh, paired up a terrific speaker and a wonderful moderator for this evening. So I'm going to hand you over to John to do a bit more of an introduction. So thanks and welcome. Thank you. I think I should probably stand up here. I need all the height I can get. Um, <laughs> in general in life anyway. Uh, it's a great pleasure to reintroduce my colleague Peter Kunick and thank you Peter Sidorko. Uh, it may sound like a bit of a cliche but Peter, um, Sidorko as well I'm sure, but uh, Peter Kunick here is a true Renaissance man. His main research field is late medieval and early English or early modern English history. His PhD at Cambridge was in English monastic history. He's published extensively in this field. In fact, he is so familiar with early English history, or early modern English history, a friend once asked me, do you work with that Australian who speaks English like an English gentleman? <laughs> and I knew immediately who he was talking about. <laughs> uh, but he, of course, has immersed himself in local history since he arrived here at Hong Kong U in 1993. And by local, I don't just mean Hong Kong history, because Peter is also interested in the history of British missionaries in China, and he is published in that field as well. Peter also has an uncanny ability, that's my seat, sorry, <laughs> uncanny ability to put the history of institutions onto paper. He's done this with the history of Magdalen College in Cambridge, uh, the history of Hong Kong U space, the history of Hong Kong U, as you've already heard from the other Peter, uh, volume one, which came out in 2002, uh, excuse me, 2012. He's already hard at work on two th volume two, although we've all agreed we're not gonna ask him when that's coming out. Uh, Peter's also an extremely popular teacher. He's taught almost 20 different courses since he's been at Hong Kong U, and he's been willing to do something that hardly any other colleague would do, and that is he's willing to do the East Asia field trip, which means not only taking students to places like Macau, but more far-flung places such as Malacca. Now, it's also a bit of a cliche to describe somebody as an academic who has stepped out of the ivory tower. Uh, but Peter has done this as well. He's a member of the Legislative Council's Archives Advisory Group. He's a chairman of the Pak Fulham Residents Association, as well as on several community task forces, including the Telegraph Bay Barging Point United Task Force, the MTR South Island Line Community Liaison Group, and those of us who are fortunate enough to live in Pak Fulham go to bed every night um, knowing that we're in Peter's good hands. Yeah. <laughs> I also have it on very good authority that this is Peter's third reading club talk. Um, the good authority here being his wife, Sarah, and as we know, we never argue with a wife. Uh, but I think this has to be a record here, the, the third uh, reading club talk. So please join me in welcoming Peter back for his third talk. Well, thank you, John, for that very uh, generous introduction. Um, it's the first time, actually, that I've given a talk here that it's been standing room only. I must admit, it worries me a little bit that uh, there might be people at the back throwing things at me later on. 
Um, I'm also aware that what I'm trying to do tonight is a bit of a, a dog and pony show, and uh, there may be too many moving parts. So if, if the wheels do fall off, um, I hope you'll, uh, you'll excuse me for it. Uh, so thank you all for, for coming tonight uh, to see some of these images from the, um, from the book that uh, uh, was published last year. Uh, when I um, first agreed to give this talk, I, I was sort of excited because I thought this is exactly the sort of book that's going to be easy to talk about. It's just all these nice images and you can just roll through them and talk about them and uh, people will be interested. But of course when it actually came to thinking about what I was going to say, I realized that a book of images is actually rather difficult to talk about. Uh, because the images, and certainly the images in this book, um, quite often really talk for themselves. The other thing that I'm very much aware of with this book is that it's only partly my book. Um, I've written the text, which is slightly less than 30,000 words, um, but all of the rest of the work has been done by other people. So the image selection for the book was really done by Frank Fishbeck, uh, whose name doesn't appear anywhere in the credits of the book. Uh, but it's really just as much Frank's book as it is my book uh, because, and those of you who will know Frank, uh, he's very meticulous about the images, about the selection, about the production and, and any, every other phase of bringing these to print. The images themselves are all taken from the Four Major archive, huge archive of, of photographs, absolutely spectacular. Um, and uh, you will see in the various volumes that have been published by Frank over the years uh, various types of images that he's put into print. And I'd like to thank Formasia tonight for allowing me to use the images that will appear in this, uh, this show. Uh, there's another group of people who were also involved in the production. Uh, very professional people, people who actually know about photographs, unlike me, I don't really know about them at all. Um, but uh, people like Satish Gobin, uh, Gominath, um, Anna Hoy, who is here tonight uh, representing Formasia, uh, Adi Lam and all the people at Format Limited. So these are really the people who've put the book together. I've just been sitting in my ivory tower writing a few uh, pithy words to, to go along with the, with the images. So as I say, this talk seemed like a good idea at the time, uh, but the more I thought about it, I wondered exactly what I was going to say. And uh, I'm more used to writing a lot of text. My last book was 300,000 words or more. This text is just under 30,000 words. So I thought, well, perhaps what I should do is just um, speak for a tenth of the time rather than 50 minutes. I'll talk for five minutes and then I'll just flick through the, uh, through the images and everyone will be happy with that. Uh, but I was told that uh, people probably wouldn't be happy with that, uh, that they would expect uh, me to say something more. So uh, I am going to show you a lot of photographs, uh, but I want to ask some other questions too about historical photographs and the way that we use them, especially the way that historians use them. The first question I want to attack is how should we use them? What are the rules of using historical photographs? Are there any rules? Um, the second question perhaps is, uh, is one that answers itself. Why are historical photographs so popular at the moment? Uh, because there's any number of books and exhibitions of historical photographs that you can see uh, from time to time in Hong Kong. Uh, some of you have asked me to talk about the actual production. How did the project work? Uh, how did I liaise with the people who were dealing with the images, etc., etc.? So I'm going to say a little bit about that. Uh, and then finally, what I thought I should possibly do, and this might be a little bit controversial, um, but I think I should say something perhaps about uh, the policy in Hong Kong for preservation and uh, use of historical photographs, or perhaps the lack of policy, uh, the lack of direction that we have, and that won't surprise uh, many of you that we don't have such a policy. Uh, well, I want to start with a photograph. And uh, this is a photograph which many of you will have seen before. Uh, it's a photograph that has appeared in, in many publications of the, uh, of the university. And this is the photograph that Frank Fishbeck used to lure me into this project. Uh, he got me in his office uh, one morning and said, uh, I'd like to show you this photograph. And I was absolutely stunned. 
Uh, I'd seen versions of this photograph many times before, uh, and in fact, I'd used it in the 2012 book. Um, but the quality of this photograph was absolutely superb, and I'm sorry that you can't get the same sort of quality in this image because PowerPoint, you actually have to use images that aren't, uh, aren't perhaps quite as crisp as, as they are in reality. But this image uh, just blew me away for the detail uh, that could be seen in it. All of the main characters could be identified. You could see their facial expressions. You could tell which ones were bored, uh, which ones were interested in what's going on. Um, it's, it's important for the university. It's the only photograph that we have of the foundation stone before it's put in place. And of course, it then disappeared under the foundations, and we don't even know where it is. And of course, it, it really marks the real beginning of the university. This is the foundation day, which we still celebrate every year on the 16th of March. But the other thing that interested me about this image was that it also told us something about the controversy surrounding the founding of the University of Hong Kong. You'll notice in, in the left of the image, towards the back of the crowd, there are in fact lots of empty chairs. And in all of the other photographs of this scene that I've, uh, I've um, had uh, access to in the past, you don't really see these chairs very clearly. But these are the chairs that the Hong Kong businessmen the tycoons uh, and, and those sorts of people uh, should have been occupying on this important occasion, but decided en masse that they weren't going to turn up. So this was a snub to uh, Sir Frederick Lugard and to the whole scheme of establishing a university at, uh, in Hong Kong. So this image is, I, I think it's very uh, representative of what images do. Uh, to historians. You immediately start looking at them and identifying the details and, and trying to read something into the image. And I was absolutely electrified by this photograph when I saw it. And perhaps that's a very emotional sort of response, uh, perhaps even an irrational response uh, to an image like this, but I guess many of us respond irrationally from time to time to works of art and perhaps a photograph should be uh, thought of as a work of art. Uh, but this perhaps also is a warning to any historian who prides himself or herself on uh, disinterested objectivity. To suddenly realize that you're behaving emotionally and irrationally uh, in front of a photograph really makes you a little bit concerned about uh, uh, your objectivity as a, as a, a historian because this sort of response is so strongly subjective and very individual. So it's for this reason that I want to talk about, uh, well, I want to ask that question, how should a professional historian proceed when you're offered a project like this? And I'm sorry to say that I agreed to the project almost immediately. I didn't even think about what a historian should be doing with uh, a book like this. Uh, I really sort of just went in boots and all and uh, enjoyed every moment of it. But as I've been thinking about this talk, I thought, well, people might ask. So I started searching for somewhere in the literature which tells you what historians should do. So I'm teaching this year, uh, this semester, a course called Theory and Practice of History. So I immediately went to the textbook and found nothing about photographs. Uh, I looked at some of the other uh, main methodological texts, nothing about photographs. I looked at some theoretical literature, nothing about photographs. In fact, I looked for almost a whole day before I found one book um, which could tell me something about what I should have been doing. Now, I'd already obviously been sensitized to the importance of photographs with the work that I'd done in the Hong Kong history, Hong Kong U history book. Um, but um, at that stage, I hadn't really thought deeply about what we were doing with those photographs. They were simply illustrating the text uh, that, we'd, uh, that we'd written. Chicago Manual of Style surprisingly tells you all the technical details about how to use photographs and how to publish them and all that sort of thing, but it doesn't talk about actually manipulating them in an, in, in an intellectual sense. It's all about the process. So past uh, publishers had told me a couple of things about photographs in history books. 
One of them is that you have to keep them to an absolute minimum because they're expensive and uh, publishers like to make a lot of money out of their books. So normally books uh, with photographs, they have a limited number and, and certainly hardly ever colour photographs, black and white uh, for preference. Most people will also tell you that photographs should only be used to illustrate points that are being made in the text. That you shouldn't just have photographs for no reason floating around next to the text, that they have to somehow be linked, linked to the text. So uh, the photographs are always text-driven rather than the other way around. If you have a book that is photograph-driven, then it becomes that horrible pejorative thing which is called a coffee table book. And of course, no respectable historian wants to be caught publishing a coffee table book. So I may have uh, breached all the rules in that sense. Um, but what I discovered when I talked to a few people is that virtually no historian has any training when it comes to selecting photographs, using photographs. Uh, we don't uh, really know much about connoisseurship. Uh, we don't have the training of art historians. So uh, the book that I eventually found after much, much searching uh, was a book by Bill McDowell from Edinburgh University, Historical Researcher Guide, published by Longmans in 2002. And in chapter five, which deals with historical sources, there was a very short section, the penultimate section just before films, and films are obviously the giddy limit as far as historical uh, 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 evidence is concerned, but photographs managed to get in just before films. I can see Stacy smiling over there because she uses films extensively in her work. Um, but this section on films was just a page and a half long. But in those in those uh, one and a half pages, there's a huge amount of, of information. I want to share some of that. So the first thing is this quotation. Some historians believe that photographs provide us with a window to the past and a more visually realistic means of emphasizing how the past differs from the present than you can possibly get from a textual source. And that's, uh, I mean, I think all of us know that. Photographs are full of information. There's an immense quantity of information. An image tells a, you know, a thousand, worth a thousand words, and there's all those sorts of sayings that we have. And quite often, this information may not be available in the written sources. But the problem with these photographs, quite often, is that they are very difficult to interpret, very difficult to fit in with the textual work that we're doing. So quite often we don't know the purpose of the photographer or of the photo. What was it made for? What's the date of the image? Sometimes we can date images. Other times even getting within a decade can be quite difficult. What was the intended audience of the image? Because that tells you something about why the image was produced and, and how it's to be viewed. So these are actually very difficult questions uh, and questions that, quite frankly, I found very challenging as this project um, uh, moved on. Well, what do these photographs tell us that textual evidence doesn't? Well, this visual evidence may confirm what we already know from a printed source. It may supplement our existing knowledge or, and this is important, it may cast doubt on the accepted testimony of other individuals. So in this sense, for historians, photos can be part of our sceptical apparatus. They can uh, cause us to ask questions about the materials that we're using. So it's sort of part of our normal verification process that we have when we're looking at any, any particular sources. But sometimes photographs provide us with absolutely unique opportunities. So old photographs may provide our only record of some events in the past because many interesting historical events have never been documented. And I think that's an important point to remember. Now the social and cultural historians worry about photographs, probably more than I do, because they will ask how typical are these images that we're using? Are they typical or are they atypical scenes? Uh, typical scenes might be day-to-day -day life within the family. Um, but these tend not to be photographed because they are so typical, so people don't take photographs of, of these sorts of things. Uh, 
Of course, the other problem with photographs, and especially historical photographs, is that in the early years of photography, it was a technically demanding uh, process. It was expensive. And so having your likeness made was actually a very special event in most people's lives. It didn't happen very often in the 19th century. People dressed up. Uh, they behaved differently in these stage situations. It was an artificial and, uh, and a very staged sort of environment in which these photographs were taken. So what we find is that atypical events in people's lives are photographed and are put into family albums. So marriages, holidays, reunions, significant anniversaries, things that only happen once. And so this presents a problem for a cultural or a, 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 a social historian. Just how typical is this of life at the time? There's all this, also this worry about authorship. Because the photographer is there and the photographer is interfering with what's going on during the sitting. So truer images of reality are probably those that are taken uh, from unposed situation, so what we would call the snapshot. But of course a snapshot wasn't technically feasible uh, until later in the 19th century, so we tend not to have these snapshot uh, photographs until much later. Of course buildings and the natural environment are less problematic as subjects. You don't have to set them up, they just sit there and, and they're, they're, uh, they're photographed. So you don't have some of these authorial problems when it comes to uh, buildings and natural landscapes. Although I guess uh, as, uh, as uh, photographers of the landscape uh, might tell you, uh, a, uh, a photographer may wait a long time until exactly the right light conditions and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are present before the photograph is, is taken. So there's all sorts of ways in which these historical photographs are problematic. But despite those, despite those problems, um, they've been used in historical books um, for many, many decades. Uh, they're increasingly popular in books. And in Hong Kong, in particular, uh, the interest in historical photographs has been growing enormously in recent years. Books exhibitions, even sales of historical photographs. They're actually much more expensive now than they used to be. I wish I had have bought them when I arrived in Hong Kong over 20 years ago. So, so what is the reason for this? Why are these um, uh, images becoming so popular? Well, I think a lot of this goes back to the growing interest in heritage preservation, as most of our um, built environment disappears, and this is particularly acute in Hong Kong. And I'll mention just three examples. Kinyin Lei, the 1937 house on Stubbs Road, uh, was damaged by the uh, so-called renovators in 2007, and it had a, uh, a, a, a it was declared a monument in 2008, and obviously saved, saved and restored. And this really sensitised people in Hong Kong to the importance of uh, of preservation. Ho Tung Gardens, built in 1926. A lot of people didn't like it. Uh, other people did. Uh, in 2011, it was uh, uh, made a, list, a grade one listed building. That didn't save it, though. In October 9, uh, 2013, it was demolished, and it's no longer there. More recently, we've had um, some archaeological relics found at the Tokwa Wan MTR site, uh, dating from either the Song or Yuan dynasty, we're not sure which. Um, but uh, this has been in all the newspapers, and of course the MTR is in terrible trouble and doesn't know what to do, and it's going to be very expensive to get around the problem. Uh, but the response from the Hong Kong community was enormous and, and almost immediate when this, uh, when this issue came to light. So. Hong Kong people have been sensitised to the built environment in a way that was never the case in previous decades. Certainly uh, not when I arrived here uh, 20 years ago. As well as that, you get a concomitant feeling of um, nostalgia, I guess, for the good old days. And in the good old days, as we all know, everything was better. And 
A recent exhibition by Leo Wong, of photographs that he took in the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, photographs of unposed everyday life, and you see just two images there of the photographs that he used, uh, I think um, uh, represent a new sort of interest in photography and historical photography, which a lot of people are seeking. And it, this is out of a, a sense of nostalgia. And it's very interesting uh, what Leo had to say. Uh, they lived a different life, and they might be poor compared to these days, but they were happy. They were happy. So old photographs provide an escape from the hardships, the disappointments, and the cares of our contemporary urban life. And this is something that... Uh, that is being taken up more and more and I guess this means that people are more dissatisfied in <laughs> at the moment than they have been so so perhaps they're looking back at these heritage photographs in a different light. Um, South China Morning Post has been publishing quite a few of these and uh, and I've never actually seen the South China Morning Post do this before so they've obviously got onto the bandwagon and, and they think it's a good idea. Uh, these uh, colour photographs taken in 1954 giving us a, sh uh, a wonderful snapshot of life in Hong Kong from someone who just comes through the city and takes a lot of snaps and uh, they get buried uh, for 50 or 60 years and then rediscovered uh, when they're cleaning out the house. The other thing that's working here I think is a professional interest by heritage and conservation specialists and I don't think Ho Yin or Joseph Ting are here tonight um, but they're the sorts of people who are helping the Hong Kong community come to terms with the loss of heritage. And there's a current campaign by the Hong Kong Architecture Centre to increase public awareness of the architectural heritage of Hong Kong by nominating historical buildings and telling, uh, to, to, to try and tell people what the best or the, or the favourite historical buildings are in Hong Kong. So 370 nominations. Uh, narrowed down to a hundred buildings and you can go online tonight and you can vote for your buildings. So this is getting this message out to a very large number of people through new media. The other thing that I think perhaps is, is happening is that there is a political agenda here. Um, perhaps we can call it urban activism. Uh, perhaps it has something to do with failed government policies. Perhaps it has something to do with a general malaise in society. I, I wouldn't like to say what's causing it. But we see examples of this elsewhere as well. So um, here we have the example of Shen Jiguang's uh, haunting um, photographs of uh, what is a rapidly disappearing urban environment in Beijing. And I think this resonates with a lot of people in Hong Kong who've seen a, who we've seen similar things happening here as well. And I think all of this links up with concerns about uh, the loss of intangible heritage. And of course, intangible heritage is stuff that photography can capture much better than text. So people who are interested in intangibles are turning now to photographs. So this has led to a boom in publishing. Of, of these sorts of books and this is where I have to turn here and I'm going to give you some show and tell. So the different sorts of books that you can find out there in the market and I'm not, uh, I'm not plugging any of these but uh, what I hope this will show you is that there is money to be made out there and I mean publishers don't publish these sorts of books unless they know they're going to make a profit. So you get um, little books like this, Hong Kong, Another City, Another Age, uh, authored by Peter Moss, who's with us here tonight. And actually, Peter, I'm going to be showing a lot of your books. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's a sort of small pocket book that you can take. Um, this rather nice big one, The Classic Age, beautiful photographs once again, lovely paper. Uh, everything is absolutely first class about, uh, about these books. Someone like Fergal Keane, who uh, Peter also helped on, on this book, a, a sort of a smaller version, uh, but authored by someone who every, whose name everyone recognizes. And then this one I particularly like, Peter, uh, with this wonderful title, Once Upon a Time, Hong Kong. 
And these are the sort of the Rolls Royce, the uh, you know the the QE twos of the uh, uh, of the genre. Lovely big um, uh, big format books. So um, and and mine. I think comes in, you know, it's, it's not quite as big as Peter's last one, uh, but it's a bit thicker, so, you know, we, uh, you know, give and take, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. And of course, the title for this book, Old Hong Kong, has actually been used before. Uh, for Major used the title in uh, 1987, 1989. Some of you might have seen that huge three-volume collection called Ong Old Hong Kong from just before the handover. And, and the text for that, of all of those books, was written by Tria Wiltshire. So they come in different shapes and sizes, but they all have a general pattern to them. They normally consist of an interpretative essay, a sort of historical essay at the, at the start. Then you get all the photographs, and with the photographs you get captions to tell you what you're actually looking at. Now a similar approach uh, has been taken uh, outside of the commercial sector um, by the Hong Kong Museum of History. And, and this book, The City of Victoria, published in 1994, is a sort of a, a more highbrow, perhaps academic approach using the photographic collection at the Hong Kong uh, Museum of History. Um, a similar sort of approach uh, was, um, was taken in earlier times, um, but it's, this, this sort of book is very similar to these sorts of books, uh, in a way, uh, because it's not completely academic. All right, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about academic uh, things in a moment. Well, not everyone agrees that uh, this fashion or trend for historical photographs is either healthy or desirable. And uh, this appeared in the South China Morning Post last year. And it says, when uncertainty takes hold, the local publishing industry is on hand to feed the increasing appetite for nostalgia. Old Hong Kong, the title of my book, <laughs> old Hong Kong picture books have been publishing staples for decades. This shrewd business model enables old photographs to be artfully repackaged every five years or so to sell to fresh waves of expatriates eager to know what the place looked like in former times. Ra ra. <laughs> Prose and historical accuracy barely matter. Unbelievable. <laughs> the contrast between a Victorian city obliterated and transformed in today's, into today's metropolis is ultimately what sells. Now this rather cynical view is, I think, uh, just a little bit out of step uh, with what is currently happening uh, with historical photographs in Hong Kong. These sorts of books are now much better researched than they ever were before. They are beautifully produced and they sell to a much wider audience uh, than just those fresh waves of expatriates who are flooding into Hong Kong in ever greater and more worrying numbers. <laughs> and in fact, you can buy these books very cheaply. I'm not sure how many of you went to the um, Moon Chu Foundation uh, exhibition at the Museum of History in 2013, Images Through Time, but by the time I got there, all of the books had been sold. And the reason for that was that you got 400 books of photographs for only $250. So it was a very good bargain. So this is not something that is only in the expatriate community. This is not about a post-colonial uh, nostalgia or desire for uh, what the British colony used to be like. Uh, it's, it's something else. Now we do have other academic approaches, and I'm just going to mention a couple. Uh, some of you uh, may remember uh, Hong Kong Going and Gone, published in 1980 by the RAS, uh, the results of a photographic survey in May of 1974. And interestingly, those photographs which were current at the time were used in 2008 in this much larger and more spectacular book edited by Veronica Pearson and Tim Coe, uh, which included a very, uh, an excellent historical uh, text, lots of essays there uh, to go with the photographs. Uh, the other book that I want to mention tonight, and it's great that Ed Stokes is here, is, is his own book, 
on Hedda Morrison's photography in immediate post-war Hong Kong. These, once again, are beautiful images and done with such, uh, you know, wonderful um, uh, um, research, Ed, and, um, and it's, this is the sort, this is sort of the, the Rolls-Royce of, of the academic approach to, um, to these books. Uh, a number of other books have appeared. There's this one, the, photo the photography of John Thompson. Some of you will have been to the uh, exhibition in the Maritime Museum. And once again, you've got a highly academic and, and relevant text, which is still readable. And I think that's the important thing. Uh, it has to be readable. Other people I want to mention, uh, Jonathan Wattis is one. Jonathan, for the last 25 years, has been publishing these wonderful um, uh, catalogues for his exhibitions, and they're not just catalogues of, uh, of the images, but he's tried to identify them, and sometimes he writes essays about them as well. Um, David Clark, in our fine arts department, um, published this book, Reclaimed Land, um, and of course, a lot of these photographs are now historical too, even though uh, it's only, uh, I can't remember when he published it, 2002, so it's only 13 years ago, but these are now historical images. And uh, Nicholas Kitto, uh, who most of you won't know, but Nicholas walks around Hong Kong taking photographs, and he publishes his own uh, books of photographs. This one, Monuments to Education, uh, various schools, university buildings, etc., etc. So there is a growing appreciation, I think, that these photographs are important. And even though my own book may be considered to be a coffee table book by most people, uh, what I want to suggest to you tonight is actually that the text and the wonderful photographs lifted above just your average coffee table book. Uh, perhaps not totally academic, but uh, there we are. I think it's a, it's a little bit better than uh, the South China Morning Post would, would have us believe. Well, I want to talk just a little bit, very quickly, about how the project um, happened and, and how you actually put a book like this together. When I first talked to Frank, he said, I've got 140 images and I'd like you to write captions for them. And, and this is what he gave me to take back to my office. So it was his selection of photographs, all ring bound, with some text taken from a previous book, repeated again and again and again, just to show me what he thought the book was going to look like. And over the period which we worked on this, the number of photographs actually increased to 160. Uh, and, you know, Frank was very good because every time I said, wouldn't it be good if we had a photograph uh, that just went a little bit further on this issue, he'd say, oh, well, I just happen to have something. Let me see what I can do. So it ended up being a much bigger book uh, than it was initially intended to be. Of course, the images, um, some of them are new. Quite a few of them actually are new. They've never been seen before. Many of them, however, have been published before. So it's a, it's a combination of, of old and new. But of course, the thing about this book, like many of the other books in the genre, is that the photographs are of the highest possible quality. And I'll talk a little bit about quality in a moment. The format is 21 chapters with a historical introduction, each chapter. It's sort of like a story of Hong Kong. You begin at the beginning and you know, end at the end. Um, uh, there are chapter introductions. There are captions uh, for each of the photographs. But Frank told me right at the beginning of the project, it's all about the photographs. He's sort of wagging. He wasn't quite wagging his finger at me, but you know, we know about you historians and what you're going to do with this book. Uh, it's, it's about the images. It's not about the text. And that was difficult for me because my natural tendency is to, to write and write and write. And it, it sounds a bit churlish, actually, because the last time I gave a talk here, I complained about the Hong Kong U book and how I wasn't allowed to use enough images. Well, now I'm complaining because in this book, I wasn't allowed to use enough text. So, so perhaps historians and writers in general are just very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to get on with. So just at the start of the project, I decided to write the first 10 chapters straight out, just so that Frank could see what I had to offer. And of course, I'd written far too much. A thousand words for every chapter introduction. He wanted 300. So there was merciless, 
merciless cutting. I could, I was bleeding uh, as I was cut because I, you know, a lot of people, a lot of writers think of their uh, of their writing as religious text, you know, sacred scripture. It's very difficult to, to cut it once you've, you've written it. Uh, the interpretive essay at the beginning was a little bit easier because uh, I could write as much as I wanted. Um, but then how do you get the whole history of Hong Kong into just a few pages? And, um, you know, this really was very difficult, choosing what topics to cover. You know, people have said, but you didn't mention this or that. And I said, you know, I only had a few pages. I couldn't, I couldn't do the whole history of Hong Kong. And, of course, I'm not a Hong Kong specialist either. But eventually what we got to was a final mock-up proof like this. And I used to really enjoy receiving these because, you know, I'd, I'd be able to look through it and think, well, this is what it's going to look like, except it'll be in hard covers. So uh, we went through several versions of that uh, until we finally got to that final, and that is the final proof. That's the one that I signed off on and said, yep, that's it. Thank goodness, finished. Go print it. Now, it will surprise you to hear that this was an incredibly quick process. I agreed to do the uh, book in September of 2013. It was published in April of 2014 seven months. That is absolutely unheard of in the academic world. I have never been involved in a project which has been completed so expeditiously and so professionally. So I, I really, you know, hats off to Form Asia. They're a, they're a pretty impressive uh, operation there. I was involved at every stage and I didn't expect to be. Uh, but uh, Frank welcomed me to, to comment and to look at the images and talk about the quality, all that sort of thing, even to the stage of going to the printers. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this right at the end. So that was the, the process of making the book. Now, of course, you've all come here to actually see the images, um, and I've got 27 of them that I want to show you tonight. Uh, if you want to see the others, you have to buy the book. Um, which is very expensive, um, but uh, some of you might think it's worthwhile. So I'm only going to show you a, a selection, and this is really to illustrate two themes. First of all, people, uh, society in Hong Kong, uh, work. And then secondly, the urban landscape showing places, streets, and buildings. I have to tell you that my favorite chapter is chapter 18. It's the chapter that is titled City of Classical Elegance. And the reason that this is my favorite chapter is that I always wanted to write about architecture in Hong Kong. And no one ever allowed me to until it came to Frank. So it gave me a chance to consider the urban landscape of colonial Hong Kong and the development of this very eclectic and distinctive neoclassical architectural style uh, in all of its manifestations, from the Anglo-Indian Compradoric style down to the Edwardian Baroque and then finally to the Art Deco classicism. So it was really wonderful to be able to, to put all of these styles together and say something about them. Now, Jan Morris talks about Hong Kong being an architectural hodgepodge. So that's a bit of a put-down for Hong Kong. I actually think that that hodgepodge works and it makes this, this colonial period very distinctive. And, uh, and very characterful. And I think that that's the character which will come through in many of the images that I'm going to show you now. All right, I'm just going to blitz through them. <clears throat> so this is one of those atypical photographs that I talked about earlier on. It's a society wedding. You can see their governor, Sir Henry May, and his daughters on the right, uh, taken sometime before 1919. It's very posed, it's artificial, it's meant to be a happy event. Uh, they don't look particularly happy, and in fact, they look rather glum. So, so this is one of the problems with these images. You, you don't really get them letting their hair down at the reception afterwards and dancing and drinking and et cetera, et cetera. It's this, this very formal uh, sort of approach. Uh, the second photograph is here not because it's a building, but because of the people who are standing on the building. It's, it's the police station at Shao Ki Wan, the original police station. And this shows the division, the social division in Hong Kong just brilliantly. You have the European officers on the top balcony. Next to them are the Indians, the sort of almost honorary Europeans. 
Uh, but down on the ground floor, down below, you have the, uh, the Chinese. So this very strict division, social, uh, racial division in Hong Kong. Another thing that is interesting here is the, the signs of the climate on the building. And this is very evident in a lot of these early photographs of Hong Kong. And Steve Cannon's here tonight. He knows all about uh, what the weather does to buildings in Hong Kong. You have to spend a lot of money painting them and renovating them. So it was exactly the same in colonial times. Uh, but also, look at that immaculate garden. They're obviously very proud of their garden. And so this tells you something uh, about the people who are in charge of this, um, of this police station. Here we have Mrs. Getty Forbes at home on her veranda. And this is your quintessential middle-class expatriate idyll. This is exactly how we think the expatriates lived uh, back in, in that period. She's posed, it's very tranquil, she's very serene, she's gazing down at the book. Uh, you know, it's, it's horribly hot and terribly humid, but she's showing no sign. It's stiff upper lip, and we're doing this for Britain, and uh, we're going to jolly well look as if we're enjoying ourselves. So, um, it's interesting because you get Western and Chinese elements, obviously Western dress, Western um, uh, living conditions, but you can see some Chinese ceramics there holding up the, uh, the flower pots. Another type of image which is posed, but is, is probably more representative of what was actually happening, is this one of a Chinese letter writer and his customer. <coughs> I'm told that once upon a time, these people were everywhere in Hong Kong. I was here too late to see this, but uh, of course we know from uh, our knowledge of uh, Chinese traveling uh, overseas that someone had to write their letters home for them. So this was very much a part of, uh, of life uh, in, a, in a place like Hong Kong or Singapore or anywhere else. So it's fairly typical even though it's posed. Uh, this one, of course, is a snapshot taken in the 1930s on the corner of uh, DeVoe Road Central and Ice House Street, and it's a wonderful photograph. Uh, you can see there's lots of action in there, people walking. Uh, you can see different uh, dress, Western and Chinese dress. Uh, some of the Chinese men are wearing traditional Chinese dress, but a, a Western hat. Um, you can... Um, uh, you can see the armour there in the front, and you can see the one European who's disappearing in the distance going across to, towards the bank of Canton. The other, thing, the other interesting thing about this photograph, and some of the others I'm going to show you, is that there's no transport there. It's all pedestrian. There's a couple of rickshaws, and you see rickshaws from time to time, but no vehicular traffic. And, and this is something which I think in the modern world we find very difficult to imagine, a Hong Kong without all of those uh, vehicles and, and exhaust fumes. This is another side of Hong Kong which we now find very difficult to appreciate. Um, everything's containerized these days. Uh, but up until fairly recently, actually, everything was done by hand. Nothing was mechanized. Everything had to be carted off the ship and onto the shore and then distributed. And it was all very um, hard work, back-breaking work, in fact. And, and this really gives you the impression of that. Uh, the pole that the bananas are being carried on is straining. Uh, the duckboard seems to be straining. This is, it's just so, uh, uh, so uh, emotive. As, as an image. It, it shows you exactly what the author of the uh, image, the photographer, uh, was trying to get across. It also reminds us that agriculture and uh, junks plying uh, the Pearl River were, were terribly important uh, in the colonial period as part of the economy. This is a superb image. Uh, it shows haulage Chinese style on the central prior and it really is haulage. Those coolies uh, look as if they're oxen, yeah. straining against that, that load. And this tells you more about the privations of, of working in this sort of environment than any thousands of words ever could. <clears throat> so for that reason, it, it's a wonderful image. Uh, but it's also a wonderful image because you see the harbour office there, just about finished. This is 1905-1906. It was opened in 1906 and immediately not so much flattened but, but very badly damaged by the typhoon in 1906 where the harbour master was, a, was actually a, a victim 
of, of the typhoon. So sometimes in these photographs we can get a very interesting insight to the building process that's going on, especially with all this reclamation uh, around that time in Hong Kong. <coughs> this is the other part of the central prior. This is Royal Square. Um, and that building that you see behind is the old Queen's building where the Mandarin Oriental Hotel now is. Uh, this is the Duke of Gloucester uh, who was inspecting soldiers of the Somerset Light Infantry on the 25th of April 1929. And this is one of the images that I was able to go to the newspapers of the time and I could find a report so I knew exactly what was happening, who the people were and uh, the significance of this. So this is where textual and uh, photographic evidence uh, can be used together. You can see the popularity of these sorts of, uh, of ceremonies, lots of people there, um, and the ceremonial use of public space in Hong Kong. Uh, this is something perhaps that we don't have so much of anymore, uh, but in colonial times there was this very impressive central space that could be used at the heart of the civic uh, environment. Uh, this is another very interesting image. It shows you the joint session of the Legislative and Executive Councils for Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in June of 1897. Uh, once again, there's lots of newspaper reports, uh, but I think that the photograph is actually more valuable than all the newspaper reports put together. You can see the governor, uh, Sir William Robinson, there in the middle. You can see uh, fat Emmanuel Belilius there on the left. You can see James Stuart Lockhart with his moustaches. Uh, you can see Ho Kai sort of just peeping uh, out from the background behind uh, the governor. Uh, you can see Sir Paul Chater, very distinctive, and over on the right you can see a very young Henry May uh, in his uh, uniform as, as captain uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the local um, police force. But the most interesting character in this image is that of Wei Yuk, who is that diminutive chap on the far left. Uh, he's a blurred figure, he's completely separate from the rest of them, um, he's obviously moved just as the photograph has been taken, but this creates this, this wonderful sense that he's somehow different to the rest of them. He's sort of not really part of the team. And this once again shows you uh, the position that Chinese, even the most respected and most important Chinese, were, were, were um, uh, playing in, in colonial society. Uh, totally unintentional, of course, but it's an image which, uh, which tells you uh, a great deal. Uh, the other interesting thing about this is the old government offices that you see behind there, uh, and uh, there aren't many images of that, that building. Here we have a parade on the old cricket ground. Uh, this is the, uh, one of the parades for the uh, coronation of George V in June of 1911. You can see the old city hall behind. You can see the new Supreme Court, or what uh, the uh, LegCo building as we know it, almost finished, not quite, after a decade of, of construction. Uh, but the other interesting thing about this image, uh, apart from the celebration that's going on and the presence of all of those troops, and, and naval people uh, is that you can see the mid-levels and, and the sorts of buildings at this time. Um, so you've uh, obviously got the French Mission Building before it was the French Mission Building and completely rebuilt. You have St. John's Cathedral. Uh, you have the Club Germania. And, um, you know, it's obvious how important the Germans were in Hong Kong because they had this massive great club as big, if not bigger, than the Hong Kong Club. Uh, so that in itself is an interesting statement about relations before the First World War. You have High Clear, the, uh, the house of Emmanuel Belilius, and just right up the top, you can hardly see it, is Marble Hall, uh, the new residence of uh, Sir Paul Chater. So these images uh, tell us something about the way that urban space was organized uh, in this period. Another shot here of the mid-levels looking west from the Botanical Gardens. Uh, this is the 1890s. You can see the Union Church and the St. Joseph's Church down below, Catholic Cathedral there to the right, uh, and all of these wonderful houses of the elite, uh, the great captains, the, the, uh, uh, the wealthy tycoons. And you can see here the neoclassical architecture in its domestic idiom. It wasn't just the, the big buildings in Central. The whole of Hong Kong was this extraordinary 
uh, neoclassical city. <coughs> if we look the other way, this is a photograph taken in the 1930s looking east. Uh, you can see that the poor old Union Church is looking a little the worse for wear. Um, you can see High Clear just up on the right there. You can see in the distance on the knoll the, um, uh, the British military hospital. So, but once again, this is obviously a high class area. And uh, this is exactly, th this helps you to, to really, um, you know, understand what it was like to live in these sorts of areas in, in colonial times. I love this shot. Uh, it's of uh, Queens Road Central from the Murray Battery, taken probably sometime in the mid-1860s. And this is one of the last shots that we have of the first generation of buildings along Queens Road Central. Within a couple of years, most of these buildings had been torn down and new ones had been put in their place. And it's continued ever since then. So we have generations. And, and really, Hong Kong is like a palimpsest. There's just one level after another that's been added into the urban landscape. Uh, but you can see the first Hong Kong hotel. Uh, you can see the Pedder Street uh, clock tower. Uh, you can see the back of Dent's uh, go-downs and, and their offices. And the two spires that you can see on the left there in the distance are the original Catholic Cathedral, St. Saviour's Cathedral. Beyond the cathedral is where the Chinese part of Hong Kong began. So that's why you don't see any other towers. It's all very low level beyond uh, that, that point. So there's a clear demarcation there of where the European city was and where the Chinese city begins. This is Queen's Road Central again, uh, but this is um, close to uh, Cheung Kong Center today. Uh, you have the Hong Kong Bank Building on the left, this extraordinary neoclassical confection, those wonderful um, uh, granite Corinthian columns supporting an Im immense decorated pediment. Uh, and, and this was the style that was going to be adopted in Hong Kong in the 1890s and the early 1900s. This was the imperial style. This was Hong Kong business telling the world that Hong Kong was important. On the right-hand side, uh, you have Beaconsfield Arcade, uh, which was built slightly earlier, and it's rather Italianate. Um, but for those of you who are architects, you can see that the three classical orders are represented, the sort of um, you know, sturdy Doric, the Ionic on the first floor, and the, the Corinthian uh, on the top floor. So, so this uh, is a very uh, public statement about what Hong Kong has become during this period. The interesting thing is that the streets are empty again. And I often wonder, do the, do the photographers wait until it's lunchtime or until everyone's going home and then they take their photograph? Or is this what, I, what Hong Kong actually looked like at the time? I, I, I don't know the answer to that question, unfortunately. This is uh, that, a part of that great public square, Royal Square, uh, Statue Square as we would know it today, uh, with the Prince's Building on the left and the Queen's Building on the right. Uh, two of the earliest works of uh, Leon Orange, who is still in Hong Kong, uh, building skyscrapers today. You have the memorial to Queen Victoria in the middle there, uh, taking pride of place. Uh, and very interestingly, you have the stonemason's yard here at the bottom. This is the work that's ongoing on the Supreme Court building. So it gives you an idea of how construction projects uh, take place in the early colony. Normally you just see the completed building. You've got no idea how they actually built them. So this is actually a rather interesting image. Uh, this one of the Western Prior is interesting for a different reason altogether. Uh, it's grubby. It's busy. It's, it's full of people. Well, not as full perhaps as it is today. Um, but there's all this pollution. And you know, you think of Hong Kong as only being polluted in the last 20 years. I keep telling my guests, you know, Hong Kong 20 years ago was marvellous, clear blue skies. But in the 20s, the place was so polluted and obviously uh, just as dangerous. Uh, but just look at all those vessels. You've got steamships, you've got um, all sorts of junks and, and sailing ships uh, in the harbour there. Uh, just showing you how important uh, uh, seafaring is for Hong Kong. Uh, another quick shot of the harbour office. I just like this building, so I decided to put it in. It's very distinctive and, and unusual. Uh, another building here, City Hall. Um, uh, Stephen Davies has ri recently written an article in the RAS Journal about the architect who designed this. It looks quite uh, Parisian, I think, 
and the reason for that is that the architect was a Frenchman. So uh, uh, we have a little bit of French culture in this, this British colony. Uh, the Royal Building uh, was constructed on the Reclamation in 1905. This doesn't look like Paris or London, this looks like Chicago or New York. And it's very distinctive, some of these buildings, the way that they, uh, they depart from the, uh, the, the style that we see elsewhere. So you've got those massive architraves at the top. Uh, it's, uh, and interestingly for architects, this is this transition period from the three-story classical structure adapted for modern use to a structure where you've had to add another three stories. So this creates all sorts of problems for getting your orders correct. And uh, so as a, as a period piece, this is very interesting. Uh, this is where Lane Crawford uh, moved to uh, for their new building when, when the building was opened. Uh, the Hong Kong Hotel, uh, until the peninsula was built in the late 20s, this was the number one hotel in Hong Kong. Five stars, first class. And once again, you can see that there's a problem here with the architecture, that it's, it's like two buildings put on top of each other. Um, you know, the more rooms you've got, the more profit you make. So, uh, so Hong Kong has always had this idea that you move upwards rather than, than outwards. Uh, this is a photograph of the uh, Central Police Station, and I've put it in because, once again, it shows you the uh, stratification of the police force itself, the Europeans, the Indians, and then the Chinese in separate units. Um, but most of you will be aware that the Hong Kong Jockey Club is currently uh, renovating and, and converting this whole area into a marvellous arts uh, facility. And in these cases, these historical photographs actually have a very pragmatic use. Uh, you can see what they looked like, what the original decorations were, because most of these government buildings are treated very badly. And uh, when you start to renovate them, it's very difficult to tell what they originally looked like. So, so photographs help us to do that. I've just put in a few street scenes here for no reason other than that it's just sort of, you know, you see what Hong Kong used to look like. Uh, this is a wonderful one, the Star Ferry at the bottom of Ice House Street with the St. George's Building and the Queen's Building there uh, on either side. Once again, this is 3.20 in the afternoon and there's no one around. Where are they? Oh, probably all doing business in their offices, I guess. But once again, it's, it's an urban landscape that doesn't have many people in it. The same thing here with DeVoe Road. This is the part of DeVoe Road that people want to turn into a pedestrian precinct. Uh, you didn't have to worry about having it pedestrianised back in these days because there was plenty of space for pedestrians anyway. But you know, this is the sort of boulevard almost, a Parisian boulevard that, that Hong Kong was trying to uh, you know, catch up with the rest of the world. Of course, Queen's Road um, Central, uh, heading towards the west, is, is completely different. This is a very Chinese street, and it's only a couple of streets away from those other images that I've been showing you. And, uh, you know, a lot happening in the street as well. Even more so here. I mean, this is your typical Hong Kong street that uh, many of you will remember uh, from the old days. And everything's happening. There's children on the streets, there's bicycles, there's a hawker, uh, there's uh, all sorts of things piled up in the, in the shop front. There's a barber's pole. It's, you, you know, you can just look at this image for a very long time. It's, it's a very rich uh, sort of image. And I'm finishing with this one. This is Dagwala Street, probably in the first few years of the 20th century. This is the one that was used on the poster for the talk. And um, uh, this is interesting because you can see that you've got the sedan chair there on the left, um, but you've uh, also got the rickshaws on the right. So this is sort of a cab rank for, uh, for rickshaws in the old days. And just next to the rickshaw, you can see a man who is wearing a coat which consists of leaves. So even here in urban Hong Kong, you have this very rural sort of feel because people are wearing these traditional uh, outfits. And, and if you look very closely at these images, and you can actually blow them up because the, uh, the quality of them is so good, uh, you can see all sorts of things that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see. Now, I said I'm going to finish there, um, but I've just got a few more uh, things to say because I want to talk about policy just for two minutes, John, if I can. And uh, I think what you can see from this is that we have so many wonderful photographs of colonial Hong Kong. They're scattered all over the place, the Hong Kong Museum of History, uh, the new Moonshu Foundation collection. Uh, we've got the RAS photographs from the 1970s here in the special collections. Uh, we've got photographs in the public record office. 
The Hong Kong U Archives has a huge photographic collection. There are private collections in Hong Kong. The Form Asia Archive is one of the most significant, significant of those. You even have David Bellis's Grulo.com, which has wonderful, wonderful photographs uh, appearing all the time. So there's a great richness and diversity uh, in these images that we have. And I really think that they're vital to our understanding of Hong Kong's history, and especially the urban development of Hong Kong. But there are problems. They're difficult to access. Some of them are restricted in terms of their usage. Anyone who's tried to use images from the Hong Kong Museum of History knows that you have to shell out $1,000 every time you want to use one. So it becomes a very expensive business if you want to use a lot of them. And I'm now convinced that you do have to use a lot of them. It's no good just having one or two as examples. You've got to get lots of these together because of the, the, the almost visceral impact that they have on the person who's reading the, the book. We have a limited um, collection development policy in all of these institutions. Where do you get the money from to buy these very expensive photographs now? Time's running out. You know, these photographs, um, you can't find many of them, they're perishing, they're, there's all sorts of problems with them. And we really need to grab them while we can, if people in the future are going to have an opportunity to use them. And then there's preservation, preserving these photographs, what's being done there. Some are being beautifully preserved in the institutions, I'm not sure about the rest. Now we all know that we have a central government records office, the, the public records office. Uh, we have a film archive, a Hong Kong film archive, but we do not have a central resource for photographs, even a finding aid which tells us where all the photographs are. So I think that it's time really to use these, and I never thought I'd be saying this as a historian who's interested in text. It's time that we really work out where all these photographs are and we do something about making them uh, widely available and widely used by everyone, not just we academics, but they should be a public resource that everyone can use. So I guess I'm saying that this project has changed me as a historian. Um, photographs aren't just ancillary to the text anymore. Um, I feel that photographs are almost as important as the text. I better not say that they're as important as the text. That would be a major heresy that I probably wouldn't survive from. Um, but we all, need to, uh, we all need to pay attention to this, I think, as we work in our various projects and bring them to fruition. Finally, I just want to show you some photographs of the process because I actually went to the printing. How many book authors here have actually seen their books being printed on the presses? Not many. And I just, it was delightful to do this. So that's Frank. You can see me looking a bit severe there, but I was actually quite happy that day. Uh, Anna and, uh, you know. So, and, and the process is really quite interesting. The, the, the plates uh, are there. They all had to be checked. There's all these electronic gadgets. It's, you know, it's half old fashioned and half high tech uh, in these, uh, these printing shops. Uh, the excitement of the first sheets coming off and taking them to have a look, see if the quality is all right, what adjustments have to be made to the printing press. Uh, this is a plate actually being inserted into the printing press, one of the printing presses, uh, because in fact the printing press is five separate presses uh, which do different colours in each press. So the paper goes in one end and there's this whirring noise and, and, the, uh, and the book or the sheets of the book come out at the other end in these huge piles that are then sent off to be bound. So the finished product is that. And I apologize for going a little bit over time, John. I'm, I'm not sure if this works anymore. Does it? it it's, it's okay now. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. Um, but before I ask you some questions, I want to just say two things. One is that uh, all this talk about Rolls Royces <laughs> has made me more convinced that we don't need volume two of the history of Hong Kong U. <laughs> the left wing press is going to complain about Hong Kong U anyway. So I think that you need to do a book on old Hong Kong cars. I think that would be a fantastic Sounds book. Sounds great. As long as I can be in some of the photographs. As long as you can be in it. Yeah. I want to be in it as well. Ownership, yeah. Okay, right. um, but the second thing I want to point out is that um, you've, you've talked a lot about photos, um, and you haven't had as much time to talk about text. Um, 
dare I use the word prose, which I, I guess I can't use because we were just told in the uh, South China Morning Post that nobody can do prose anymore. But um, th your, your book really is full of really good prose. So thank you. That's that's that. Um, could I, could I say so is Peter's, yes. and yeah, Peter's prose is better than mine. Well, um, uh, anyone who's read Peter's books, uh, you know, he so has the Rolls Royce, as you <laughs> said. You've got the Jaguar, the Daimler, right? Who knows? In any case. Let's move on to some questions, though. Sure. Um, what I'm wondering is uh, maybe you could just tell us briefly how you, as a historian of early modern England, made the transition um, to, to working on Hong Kong. Was there a eureka moment, uh, an aha moment? And are there particular s techniques, uh, methodologies that you've borrowed? Uh, obviously not photographs, right? But uh, how did it all happen? Yeah. Um, I think that um, any historian, when you go to a new place, you automatically become interested in where you live. And that's basically what happened. Um, I blame Sarah, my wife, for this partially because her grandparents were in Hong Kong in the 1920s as missionaries, and they had some marvelous photographs of Hong Kong in the 1920s. And I, I remember when I first saw these thinking, I wish I had have lived here in the 1920s. It looked so wonderful. So I, I think it's an incremental thing that you, uh, you get sucked into something. And of course, there was the university history. And uh, you know, I'm not a Hong Kong historian like John. I've sort of come in into this sort of field from the side. Uh, and it's really through the history of the university that I've, I've been able to, uh, to be involved in a project like this. In terms of methodology, yes, there was no Latin uh, used at all in this project. Um, but I think in the sort of history I'm writing now, there are some, there are some areas. Um, a prosopography is one of them, and prosopography, for those who are not uh, medieval historians, is where you get lots of small biographies and put them all together into a big group biography. And this is a method that I've used in the history of the university. And for, a, um, for anyone who's interested in the development of Hong Kong, you have to know who the people are and their relationships with each other. And all sorts of patterns emerge if you can trace those relationships. So, so I, guess, I guess that prosopographical uh, technique that we use in medieval history is one of the things that I, I find to be quite helpful uh, in, in more modern history. Okay, thanks. And prosopography is obviously about people. And um, you've talked a lot about images of buildings and other structures. Uh, you've also talked about people as well. And in fact, one of my favorite chapters was the one on uh, Hong Kong's emerging middle class. Um, yeah. Although I'm not sure if some of those people look so much middle class. Uh, I think that uh, they look pretty upper class to yeah, me. Yeah, you're right. Um, but I'm wondering, um, were there any photos that made you, in particular, think differently about Hong Kong's people and Hong Kong's communities? Um, yes, there was, there was one particular photograph of a, uh, of a Chinese insurance firm, and it was their building. And uh, down in um, uh, Bonham Strand, and uh, it didn't look particularly like a Chinese, well, it sort of half looked like a Chinese building, but it was, it was very Western. And um, they were standing very proudly out in front of this building. And um, it's the first time I thought, wow, you know, these, these people are actually making a big transition from what they've done before uh, to this industry, which is very much a Western industry. And they've outfitted themselves so that they look like a Western insurance firm. And so that, that was one image that really struck me. The other image, I guess, was uh, the image of uh, the Chinese husband and the, uh, sorry, the Chinese, yes, the Chinese husband and the German wife. Uh, and it was just so striking uh, because uh, you don't expect that sort of representation of Eurasian connections in that period. It, you know, we sort of feel that uh, the whole Eurasian thing is something that people were embarrassed about, and uh, and you don't expect to find many images outside, you know, the hotels and the, you know these these very significant families. So that was one I just thought, wow, that that's really quite a quite a significant image. It shows something that you you don't often see, and with the Chinese uh, husband in Western dress rather than Chinese dress, which is what you would normally see. OK, thanks. Now, if that was my favorite chapter, my second favorite chapter is the last one, which is called Icons No More, which includes uh, images of things that at least people of a certain age, 
including myself, um, who remembers being in Hong Kong when they were still around, rickshaws, junks, and sampans. Now, for better or worse, not everybody is going to remember these icons. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, 50 years from now, when there's a sequel to, I don't know what they're <laughs> going to call it, but uh, not so old Hong Kong, um, what will the icons be? Well, the tram, I think, will be one of the icons, but will both trams, the, the peak tram and the, uh, and the ding ding. Um, I, I, th I think the, um, the escalator too. I mean, I think it's, it's funny, isn't it? A lot of these things are connected with transport. They're the things that we, that we use quite often. Um, so the red taxi, I guess people will remember red taxis when red taxis are no more. Um, yeah, but it's difficult, isn't it, to know what, uh, what are going to be the icons of, of tomorrow. But I think those things, certainly, uh, I would imagine, will have great longevity as, as iconic uh, representations of Hong Kong. Because they're so ubiquitous, you see them. You see them all around. Okay, great, thanks. Now we've got a lot of people here, some of whom have been here many, many years, some of whom have only recently arrived in Hong Kong. So. Let's, uh, let's open things up to, uh, to questions. I'm expecting someone to say, you got this one wrong. <laughs> it's always the great fear that you have. <laughs> we've got somebody in the front. Uh, maybe put your hand up so we can uh, run give you the mic, please. Thanks. Thank you for your wonderful lecture. As you said, you, you are afraid something got wrong, but uh, it's usual because uh, Chinese character would, would, would be uh, alien to you. <laughs> the, the, four, the third or fourth picture I couldn't remember, you know, mm -hmm. the, the photo you said is a lecture writer, right? Yes, yes. But to me, the wordings in Chinese should be a fortune teller fortune instead. Gang yeah. yeah. Yin, it said, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah. that's what I interpret. I may be wrong. Yeah. I, I think they may be both, you know? Yeah. It could be both letter writer and fortune teller. Yeah. Right, so the book will be half priced then. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think you're probably right. Yeah. And uh, unlike John, who's, who's Chinese and, and his colloquial Cantonese indeed is fantastic, <laughs> I don't have any Chinese at all. So uh, this is one of the, the areas in which I felt that I wasn't really totally qualified to uh, do the fo all of the photographs justice and whenever I came across anything with Chinese text in it I had to rely on someone else to translate it for me so sure. yes normally uh, you would want to have I, normally I would want to have more control I'm a sort of a control freak so I would want to have more control over that element as well but mm. you know linguistically it, it just mm. wasn't possible we had but thank seem, you. we had seem in a sort of uh, problem night what you said uh, we have a lot of uh, new Chinese uh, heritage books with wonderful pictures, but very few texts. Yeah. And it's difficult to, to research, you know, uh, what these backgrounds are. Mm -hmm. And as Peter Moss would <laughs> understand, mm -hmm. we got a photo library, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these pictures were, were taken by uh, our information officers for, for news purposes. Yes. So unless you, you understand the, the purpose of the picture, otherwise it's rather difficult to bridge the gap, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my advice is that anyone who has photographs, write on the back of them mm. so that you know what they are, because you'll forget. I've gone back to some of my photographs taken when I was an <laughs> undergraduate, and I can't remember the names of the people. I can't remember where they were taken or when they were taken. I can get within a couple of years. But so, you know, for the people who come after you and who will be using those photographs, please <laughs> put that sort of metadata in so that they're easier to identify in the future. Stacey Gould, our archivist, is shaking her head up and down. Yes. I'm, in, in I'm, in trouble. I'm in big trouble um, now. <laughs> yeah, most, as most of you know, a lot of you know me. Um, I'm Stacey. I'm the archivist here at Hong Kong U, and photographs are a big part of our collections here, both in the University Archives and here in the um, Hong On To, the Hong Kong collections of, of special collections. So um, yes, I heartily agree. Please write on the photographs. 
please also, unless you want me to haunt you until the day you die, use a number two soft pencil and don't use ink, okay? <laughs> because ink is really acidic and eventually it will eat right through the back of that photograph and cause us a lot of problems when we try to preserve them. So the other thing I wanted to mention, um, something that Peter said earlier that I'd like to sort of echo and, and make, make known. Um, Collecting and preserving photographs like this is a very, very expensive business. And making them available to lots and lots of people at once usually means making them available digitally. And I wish that the magic digital elves took care of all of that for us, but in fact, that's a pretty expensive proposition, digitizing all these photos. It takes labor and equipment and time. So the next time you've got a little spare cash, <laughs> Think about um, supporting these things that you like to see. You know, think about giving to your local archives or museums to support preservation and digitization projects because we need your help. So there was my shameless appeal. Thanks. Uh, there's supposed to be a question, <laughs> Stacey. No, thank you. Just a comment, Peter. On uh, well, to follow up on Stacey's issue of preservation, um, but. I think some of you may know that last year we ran two workshops through two three-day workshops. We brought an expert from California uh, on, on photo preservation. They were both oversubscribed. One was held here in this building, in this library. The other was in the Maritime Museum. And it, it drew the usual suspects, but it drew people from insurance companies, oh, yeah. from banks, from all over the place. So there, there is a great deal of interest in <laughs> preserving these these images now. Mm. Um, I guess I have a question um, as well, which is some words of advice on, on your final point about, um, you called it a finding aid, I would call it a metadata repository of uh, historic the images. The between a medievalist and a <laughs> librarian. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this, you know, we, we haven't been able to do this for, for books, for example. We don't have a Hong Kong bibliographic database. Uh, we do for the universities, but, but not a comprehensive single database. I mean, what, what advice would you give uh, in starting a project like that? Oh, goodness. Um, well, I don't think I'm really qualified to, to give advice, but um, I think if we wanted to have all of the historical photographs of Hong Kong somehow accessible, perhaps not all in the same place or on the same website, um, but I mean it would mean, well you'd have to have various indices, you would need to, you know, subjects and, you know, people and, you know, it'd be a very big project. I'm not sure how you'd go about it, Peter. Um, but of course what they've done at the Film Archive is that they've brought all the films into one place, so that's, and that's clearly not possible uh, with all of the photographs. But if, for example, it was possible uh, to get all of the owners of photographic images, historical images of Hong Kong, to somehow give up their copyright and to say, this is a resource that should be used for the good of the community, then Hong Kong would be leading the world, I think. You know, Hong Kong is a small place. It's more possible to do that in a place like this than it is almost everywhere else. So, you know, I, I would agree with Stacy. you know, give your photographs to proper institutions rather than selling them, uh, you know, in the various normal places that you find these things. Um, you know, perhaps sometime in the future there will be an opportunity, but I, it would be a long-term project. But I, I would, and I mean, I never really thought about this until I did this project, and I tried to find other images that were similar so that I could compare them. And it was a very, very difficult process to, uh, I mean, I spent whole days in the library carting around these massive books uh, because that was really the only way that it could be done. And even then I didn't find a lot of the images I was looking for. It's Douglas. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, <clears throat> it's always a good thing to ask historians about the future. So I, I wonder if you, would like to speculate about the future of the relationship between history and photographs because your very interesting remarks early on in the talk were sort of predicated on this 
this idea of the photograph as something scarce. So if you're looking at mid-19th century Hong Kong, there are very few photographs and they tend to be very, very special occasions. The game has completely changed. Yeah. Um, we're absolutely saturated with photographs. Nothing happens in the world which is not photographed, which is bad news for some policemen, for example. <laughs> um, so it's going to be different, isn't it, in future? Well, in one sense, yes, I think it, and I think it already is different because we've now moved into that stage where typical things are being photographed all the time and put up onto the internet and goodness knows what. Um, but you don't see many photographs these days. You see them as digital images, but you don't actually see the real thing too much anymore. And what I've noticed with a lot of digital images is that they don't have the depth, they don't have... I don't know, there's something about these photographs that you, you can't quite quantify, and I guess it would take someone who's a specialist like Ed uh, to tell us what the difference is, but there is something very special about these images that, um, that are actually an article, uh, an artefact. So I wonder whether we're going to have many artefacts in the future because they're all going to be somewhere in cyberspace, on your PC, on your laptop, um, in the cloud, whatever the cloud is. Um, and how are you ever going to retrieve them? And I mean, it may be easier. Some, there may be some wonderful computer program that's, that's developed in the future which will make those things available. But I think that it would be a great shame if we don't have the artefact anymore. And I, you know, I'm someone who reads books still, Douglas, as books rather than on a Kindle. So I'm, you know, perhaps some of us are just a bit old fashioned. But, you know, there may be a point in the future where images become more difficult to find because someone's hard drive has, has melted down and there's not a backup. You, know, you can think of all sorts of catastrophic uh, you know, magnetic pulse accidents and, and things uh, which destroy half of our civilization as we know it, digitally, <laughs> if not physically. So I don't know the future. I, uh, I really wonder. I think there may be a time where these images are just as rare and important as they are today. I think there was a question over there, Charles, who, who knows something about uh, photos himself. Thank you so much, Peter. Wonderful talk. It's a beautiful book, and I, I, it's kind of a follow-on from Douglas in a way. The question I have, and, and did you get an act, did you get access to all of the photographs? Because you said earlier that uh, he gave you Frank gave you the photographs, and then you had to write the text. Did, did, was there ever a point where you said, "Look, I want to look at all of"? The, fo the photos, and if so, were there any crappy ones? Because you know, I think about all of the photographs in albums I've seen, and it's like there might be five or six really good ones, and there's like a hundred that are just crappy. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, Frank's collection ranges from glass plates, which he dares not touch, all the way through to very modern digital images. He has photograph albums that people have collected, and yes they do have some images that are subpar, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but the nature of his collection is such that he has been collecting the best images possible. And if someone comes in off the street and says, would you like these photographs? Uh, I suspect that what he does is say, well, I'll have that one, that one, and that one, that you can take the rest away. There were very few images that I saw that weren't, uh, that weren't excellent, actually. Um, initially, th this is what I got, this is what I started with, and it took me a while to work through it and to identify everything to my own um, satisfaction. Um, it was at that stage that I then said, well, you know, there's a couple of themes here that, uh, that we could explore, or this photograph doesn't really fit in, or, you know, have you got a better image of this? And he would then go back and uh, he would find new images. And so I've, I've never seen the whole collection. He has shown me a lot of his, his images, but, uh, but no, there are thousands of images. So in that sense, doing the sort of project that you're perhaps suggesting of making my own choice, uh, which I guess is what we really want to do. I know this is what you're doing at the moment with your book. Um, yes, we'd love to do that because it gives you more control. But 
Uh, but I think given the time that was available, my teaching uh, 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 schedule, et cetera, et cetera, I was quite happy to, to allow the expert to tell me this is an excellent image, this is the one that we should be using. But Peter, as, as, but as a historian, what makes a great image for you? And, and that, that could be very different from an artist, that could be very different from a publisher. But as a historian, what makes a great interest to you? Yeah. Well, image to you? I would have once said, when, uh, when everything was text-driven, I would have said, a great image is one that illustrates the point that I'm trying to make in the text. <laughs> because I'm important, it's my text that's the, uh, the text comes first. But I've had to reconsider that now, I think. And um, so a great image for me now is, I mean, I wouldn't say that I'm a connoisseur of images, but like most of us, we know what we like and what we don't like. And sometimes you just see an image and you think, oh wow, that's a really good image. Yeah, it might be the people in it, it might be the, com the composition of the image, whatever. Um, but for me, the really great images are the ones that tell a story on their own. It's as if I don't have to tell the story. You know, you just say where it is and, and perhaps what's happening in a very general sense, and then the image just tells you everything you need to know. So I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm still not sure, Charles, how you write a book where the image drives the text without it turning into something like this. I know your book is a, is a different animal altogether, um, and it may be possible, but I'm, I'm not sure for me that I will ever do another project like this where the image is quite so important. So I've not lapped so far into heresy that I'm going to completely change the way that I, I do things, I think. That's right, that car book's gonna change everything, don't worry. <laughs> uh, we have one more question over here. If you keep your hand up. Uh, Peter, thank you for a truly fascinating talk, absolutely wonderful, enlightening. Um, I, I won't go into the traditional digital photogra photography debate, that's far too complex for now. Uh, one note, one question. Uh, unless I heard you wrong, you referred to a photograph that looks across Statue Square to Prince's Building and um, Queen's Building with a building site, and I think you suggested it was... Uh, the LegCo building or the Supreme Court building? Uh, the stonemason's yard for the oh. LegCo building, which is on the left right. hand Right, and on the right, the Hong Kong Club, I think. Yeah, that's correct, mm. yeah. Uh, the question, in your research, did it come out how many, or, or, or how well or not, could you identify the uh, photographers? And if you could, what was the breakdown between indigenous Chinese photographers and Westerners? Yeah. either living here or passing through? I knew that this was a question that someone was going to ask me. And uh, I don't have a really good answer to it, I'm afraid, Ed. But look, most of these photographs, we, we don't know who took them. Um, if, if some of them still had their mountings on them with the photographer's name, that would be helpful. Um, there are some which I suspect, well, and I know that, um, that Frank does have some, some John Thompson images. Um, and, you know, you can normally tell them because it's 1869 and it's the visit of the Duke of Edinburgh and so you sort of put two and two together and you think, well, perhaps this is a, this is a Thompson image. Um, but for most of them, no. I mean, some of them perhaps are Fong, but, you know, who knows? There is a book called Picturing Hong Kong, actually, that does a pretty mm. nice job of it trying does. to identify some of, some of the photographers. Mm. Um, you had one, uh, your hand up. Maybe one very quick question, and then we, we finish. Okay, it is quick. Um, you often find um, a lot of old photographs on the internet, um, but it's difficult to know who actually owns them. And I was under the impression, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but um, copyright couldn't be preserved beyond 50 years. So did you find copyright a problem? And can people preserve ownership, copyright, for a period long, for photographs that are older than 50 years? Um, my understanding of, of copyright is that it, it does expire after a time, but if you own the photograph, then you own the image. So you can charge what you like for it and you can stop people from using it because you own the actual artifact itself. So, and this is one of the problems with trying to get 
all of these images freely available. There are a lot of images on the internet which shouldn't be there. Um, and legally speaking, people would be in big trouble if, if anyone went to task to, you know, to, to investigate it. Um, but because these, um, these images are now so unique, you don't have several copies of them anymore. There may have been lots of copies initially, but now you've only got that one copy. It's the only one that exists. So if, uh, if you own the copy, you can auction it, and whoever buys it then owns the artifact, and they can charge however much they like for as many copies with restrictive usage of those copies. So this is a legal nightmare, I think. Um, but my experience with using photographs in, uh, in other books that I've worked on is that as long as you acknowledge the source and, um, uh, you know, people are, are normally quite happy to have the image used, especially in, a, um, in an academic sort of book. It's a bit different when it's uh, commercial. Uh, but I've never really had too many problems getting permissions. I've had to pay. Uh, and I think that's fair because people have to preserve the images, they, they have to look after them, they have to post them to you, <laughs> you know, there's all that business. Um, but I do think that a thousand dollars an image from the Hong Kong Museum of History um, is a bit steep actually. I think that the Hong Kong government can probably allow the taxpayers of Hong Kong to have access to those images for free. Perhaps I'm just an idealist. but. There we are. Speaking of access and speaking of paying, um, our good friends from Swindon's are here outside to make sure that you have near instant access to a signed copy of Peter's wonderful book. Uh, Peter, we look forward to welcoming you back for round four oh. sometime very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. just have uh, some announcements before I give the gentleman souvenirs. Um, a couple of events. Well, first of all, Ed Stokes has been mentioned and um, has asked a question. Uh, Ed is working with, with the library uh, to run two exhibitions, hopefully within the next few months, uh, sometime this year, uh, both dealing with old Hong Kong photos, two s separate exhibitions. but. Just watch our website to hear more about those. Uh, other advertisements, we're having a book sale on the 5th and the 6th of March. Not these books and not these books. All the books that we're selling are $20. So but I know Peter, Peter's a, a fan of our annual book sale. Uh, we're having our next book talk, which will be on the 5th of March. And it will be six speakers who are finalists and winners from the Proverse International uh, Book Prize and the coordinator of that, Gillian Bickley, is also here. Hi Gillian. Um, so that's on the 5th of March and then there'll be another book, uh, book talk on the 26th of March. Uh, on the book topic is the, the Philosophy of Fearism by Desh Suba. So I hope you can all come to some of those events uh, in the future. So thanks for coming and just some small souvenirs. It's hard to know what to give these gentlemen because we've given them uh, all of our standard uh, library souvenirs. So these are non-standard, very large boxes. <laughs> Please join me in well, thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. I'm, I'm fascinated. <laughs> it's a large box. Wow. Oh, wow. It's very nice.